And so I spent about a year and a half traveling around the US and the Caribbean hunting and fishing for invasive species, looking just to see are there examples of some of these species where, where hunting and fishing could, for them could make a difference. And, that, and in what I found, that in some cases, it's not going to make a difference. And in other cases, you know, even having just a few people signing up and saying, yeah, I'm going to take personal responsibility. In some cases, it, it can make a huge difference. So one of the first things I went after when I started eating aliens was the black spiny-tailed iguana. These guys look like little dinosaurs. Usually when you think of iguanas, you think of green iguanas that a lot of people keep as pets. And um, these guys, the black spiny-tails, they uh, they're different. I, I don't even really think they should be taxonomically lumped as close to the green iguana as they, they, uh, as they are. Uh, I don't know that the molecular biology is going to bear out a close relationship between them. But uh, these guys have, um, they have sharp teeth that are hooked backwards for, for grabbing prey. They've got sharp claws, and actually their tails they can use as whips. They've got these little um, uh, serrations on the tail that actually can draw blood with that. Uh, one odd thing about the black spiny tail is that in its native habitat in Mexico and in Central America, they're actually, the adults are actually herbivores. Uh, but this population in, in Florida, on Gasparilla Island, that is descended from just a handful, of probably three or four black spiny tail iguanas that somebody about 25 years ago had in his backyard. And he had them because his grandkids liked looking at them. And uh, I guess uh, at some point they were, he was tired of having them. He just opened up the cage and let them go. So this entire population on this whole island, Gasparilla Island, it's on the Gulf Coast of Florida, is descended from this handful of, of lizards. The adults on uh, Gasparilla Island are dedicated carnivores. They are completely unlike, in, in their feeding behavior, unlike the original population. And this is probably what, uh, what biologists refer to as the founder's effect, where you have a founding population that's very small. You can have some oddball characteristic among those founders, and that become, if, if, if that population is able to expand, it, it could be a, a habit that it isn't even particularly productive, but if the, if the species has a lot of other advantages as an invader, where it doesn't have predators specializing in them, like you would normally have, like, a, there be um, uh, monitor lizards that, that eat these guys, uh, then you can have this sort of almost harmful behavior that can still proliferate. And so this is an example of it. Uh, the black spiny tail iguanas in, in, on Gasparilla Island, they will eat pretty much anything that fits in their mouth. Um, here is one of the biggest problems that, um, that, that we're going to be facing down the road from the black spiny tail iguana. And this is because of, this is the, the gopher tortoise. Uh, the gopher tortoise, they get about yay big. They are a very important species in, uh, in, in Florida and around the Gulf Coast. Uh, the, go go the gopher tortoise is what's called a, a keystone species. And it's called the gopher tortoise because they dig these burrows and, um, that they'll, they'll hang out in. And these burrows are used by a lot of other species. So they'll create these structures that a lot of other animals used, a lot of other um, uh, native reptiles, a lot of insects, uh, some small mammals. And gopher tortoises also, they're, they're, uh, they're beneficial to a lot of plants that depend on them because there, there are some plants mm -hmm. where they eat the fruit and the seeds and they spread the seeds through, drop, through droppings and there's not much else that is gonna disperse those seeds. So it's a keystone species, it's really important. Now this guy, this particular gopher tortoise that I found, he was probably about this big. And that was the smallest gopher tortoise I saw on any of my trips to Gasparilla Island. Uh, and I saw many dozens of gopher tortoises. Now what does that tell you? They're all this big or larger. Uh, they're not reproducing successfully anymore. Or rather they do, they lay eggs. And then the uh, black spiny tail iguanas, which they, they, will, they, will, they will dig burrows on their own anyway, they go down into the ground and they eat the baby tortoises. And so what's gonna happen? You know, there's, these guys aren't gonna live forever. Right now, <coughs> they're still functioning as a keystone species on this, on this uh, island, but if the iguanas aren't removed, you know, another 20, 30 years, the gopher tortoises are gonna be gone because they just have no natural reproduction happening. And I've uh, heard in the last 18 months or so, the, um, the spiny tails have made it to the mainland. People have been spawning them as roadkill. Uh, there's one guy named George Sarah on Gasparilla Island who has just dedicated himself to eradicating these things. He's, he uh, shot, I think it was, when I first visited him, it was around 18,000 of them, and it was under contract for a while with the city, so there was somebody whose job was counting George's dead iguanas at the end of every day. He lost the contract for a long time, and he kept hunting them. He d would cruise around in a golf cart. Actually, at one point, um, uh, so I, I, I drove around, we were hunting them with air rifles, uh, on this uh, on Gasparilla Island, and it's sort of this uh, high-end vacation community. We're there off-season, but the Bush family, uh, as in President Bush, has a vacation house there. And at one point, I realized we were parked in this golf cart in front of George Bush's 
family place with a pair of scoped rifles that were hiding under a, ta under a, a towel <laughs> and pulling out to pop lizards. And, and the scary thing is Secret Service did not descend on us. There was, no, uh, there was no reaction whatsoever. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's, uh, it's a thing that happened. <coughs> The, the spiny tail iguanas do, I will say, they, are, they taste just fine. They're really good. Um, I wouldn't say they taste exactly like chicken. They're, it's, it's close. The texture is more like crab. So it's like crabby chicken. It works really well, I found, in, uh, in Mexican cuisine. And I think that's often a good, good idea. If you have some weird thing, some weird creature, and you're thinking, how do I eat this? How do I make it taste good? Every single time what I came back to is look at the native cuisine of, from wherever this invader was from. They've usually found a way to eat it. And so, yeah, they've been eating these things in, um, in, in Mexico and Central America for thousands of years. And it's no surprise that uh, you know, tacos with a, you know, uh, uh, a little bit of lime or you know, the tortilla there are going to make them taste good. <laughs> uh, okay, tilapia. Everybody's seen tilapia in the grocery store. It's pretty much, um, uh, it's, it's everywhere. Although most people have no idea what an actual tilapia looks like. This is what a tilapia looks like. The crazy thing with tilapia is that we, most of them, if you look at country of origin, when you go buy it at the grocery store, it's coming from India, it's coming from Thailand, it's coming from China. And meanwhile, uh, I threw cast nets in all kinds of um, uh, uh, water on golf co courses, ponds, and in canals. And these, these tilapia are everywhere in Florida. And they're an invasive species. They're a problem. They're kind of general purpose herbivores. They'll eat all sorts of plant matter. They were intentionally introduced about 35, 40 years ago um, by biologists from the state of Florida before they realized, you know, no, not everyone had gotten the message about how problematic invasive species were going to be. So they were dumped out there on purpose. Um, there are actually about a hundred different species of cichlids, which are a group of fish that are referred to as tilapia. This particular type of um, tilapia is native to, um, to South America. It doesn't belong there at all. So the crazy thing is, why are we burning all of these fossil fuels to take tilapia from the other side of the world and bring them here when we've got you know, hundreds of waterways in Florida that are filled with them? and you know, and, and, and nobody's doing it. Nobody else, I didn't see, any, I've never seen anyone else in Florida fishing for tilapia. Of course, they won't take a hook and line. You have to use a net. Uh, but it's, it's just ridiculous that if we, could har if we could harness the tragedy of the commons, you know, to start getting these things out of, um, out of waterways in, in Florida, it would be a net gain for everyone and we wouldn't have to burn fossil fuel getting them from the other side of the world. This, these are a couple other species. That, uh, this is an armored catfish here. And then anybody recognize this guy? This is a pleco. Lecostomus. People keep them in aquariums to because um, uh, they're algae eaters. You see that big fish on the side of the tank that's like, you know, stuck to the side there and sucking algae. That's what these are. And uh, the plecos are native to South America. You find them in the Amazon basin, and they're very popular in the pet trade. But uh, people don't realize how big they actually get. Uh, in the wild, they will get up to four feet long. They are huge. And what happens is the fish gets big, somebody gets bored with the aquarium, and they just dump it out. And there are a lot of invasive species in Florida in particular, and then some even here in Albemarle County, that uh, are a result of aquarium dumping. And you might think, well, it's kind of harmless. It's just this thing that sort of sucks algae, and what's, what's the big deal? There are waterways that are filled with them. Most fishermen in Florida have no idea how many of them there are because they never catch them because they don't take a hook and line. Again, they're sucking algae off things. The, those guys are a big danger to manatees, actually, because during cold weather in winter in Florida, the manatees, what they need to do is just literally chill out. They just need to uh, sit still and conserve energy until the water warms up and they can move around again. And, th that, and staying still is very important to them. What happens is these plecos, they'll kind of um, glide all over the manatees and try to suck algae off of them, and it pisses off the manatee. And it, the manatee gets up and shakes and goes you know, 20 feet away, and then more plecos come on it. And they're, so they're burning calories. Um, they're coming out. You know, in the, the manatees that are in areas that have a lot of plecos, they come, uh, they come out of the winter in the spring a little bit underweight. And it's like, how much worse can this get? If you have a cold enough winter, in Flo like this winter in particular, where they've got to bu burn more calories just to stay alive, you know, the difference that, that the plecos make could be, you know, between the difference between whether a, a manatee makes it to spring or not. Uh, and then up here in the upper hand corner, you have this may be part of the reason why there's not much commercial harvest of, um, uh, of uh, tilapia going on in Florida. You do have to sort of fight with the alligators. That's, that's the, um, the uh, rope that attaches to my cast net. I was on a, uh, on a bridge actually in uh, Mayaka River State Park throwing the cast net. And there are a few um, uh, 
they're, they're, they're a bunch of uh, immigrant communities that have that cast netting tradition that live there, and they go through a cast net sometimes. And um, the gators have learned that when that net comes down, there might be a meal on one end, and there's definitely a meal on the other end. So what this, this was about an eight-footer, and there were probably three or four of these gators that were right down there. And the net would go in, and they would sneak up underwater. They'd come up, they'd grab the rope or the net, net and they'd twist and pull real quick. Now, normally you have a cast net, you have the leash attached to your wrist. So if you're in gator country, you know, tie it off to the bridge. That's, my, <laughs> that's definitely my advice. But um, a lot of times these guys would grab the net, and there was nothing you could do except you just have to sit and wait uh, until they move off. This is the pleco, okay, the after it has been cooked, and which seems really weird. I used to have plecos in aquariums. I felt kind of weird about eating something that looked like a pet. But uh, we actually, this is mango. This is the, the guy in the, the last picture, George Sarah. That's the iguana guy. When I went down uh, to work with him on the iguanas, we became really, we actually became good friends. We've kept in touch. And so when I had to go down after the, the fish, um, I asked him to come out with me and, um, and help me find them. So George had uh, three or four different species of mango tree growing in his backyard, actually. And, um, and so I was looking for a way to cook these fish. I took the pleco and I took the uh, tilapia. And I squeezed the uh, uh, mango juice all over. I soaked both fish in the mango juice, a little salt, a little pepper, and then took a bunch of that mango pulp. And I wrapped them up in, in tin foil, put it in the oven. I took them both out. And we did a taste test. I did a blind taste test. And you know, George did not want to eat pleco, but he didn't know which one he was eating. So he kind of 50-50 was hoping it was tilapia, which he was used to. And um, he and I both agreed, actually, the pleco tasted better. It had firmer texture. It was a little bit sweeter. It was good. You know? So you think uh, this is this weird fish that you know, it's, it, it's in the pet store. Why would you want to eat it? Actually, most of us have eaten tilapia, and then the, the pleco is better. And in fact, I've eaten all kinds of weird fish all over the US and the Caribbean. All, all fish taste fine. And actually, there, there's been good DNA studies that have been done. There was one in, um, in New York City a couple years ago where they went around and took samples. They bought fish at all kinds of different markets and restaurants and looked at what it was sold as. And a lot of times, what, you know, Chilean sea bass, in fact, in a majority of cases, what was sold as Chilean sea bass actually was either catfish or tilapia or something. People have no idea what they're eating. And Amer Americans, we have no idea what kind of fish is what. So why eat the Chilean sea bass when, you know, you could eat the pleco, which probably tastes better and is something we need to get rid of.